but I'm so, so excited to welcome everyone to our book discussion this morning. Um, this is the premier event of the WHC Empty Nesters Book Club. What a way to start. <laughs> and I, I do think we should say a shahachianu. Um, I'm gonna ask everyone to remain on mute, but I wanna see all your mouths moving with me so we can say this, this the shahachianu is our prayer of Thanksgiving, um, not the capital T for next week, but our prayer for, for things that we are grateful for, um, also for things that we're doing for the first time. And this is the first time for the Empty Nesters Book Club. And again, what an auspicious way to start. And so let's join together in the Shehachianu prayer. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Shehachianu V'Kiyamanu V'Higiyanu Lazman Haza. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, ruler of the universe, for giving us life for sustaining us and for enabling us to reach this time, this moment, this day. Uh, and what a wonderful, wonderful day it is. Um, I also want everyone, uh, I wanna let everyone know that um, since you've all registered for this event, uh, we have your email address and um, don't worry, you're not getting lots of spam, but we can easily get in touch with everyone about future events. And I know we're, we're working on those already. Uh, and I want to, in particular, give a shout out and thank you, express gratitude to Jeff Bergman and Ruth Seif that, um, and they'll be, we'll, as we'll move forward, you'll, you'll be hearing about additional events. Um, also, Beth Donaldson, who provides wonderful administrative support to, um, to the empty nesters. Um, and Ruth reached out to me on October 1st to, um, to see if I would be interested in moderating a discussion with Janine Cummins about her book, American Dirt. And I jumped at the chance. Uh, I had just finished the book days before. It was, um, it was my treat. I actually had saved it for myself for um, post high holidays. Uh, clearly, I was not the only one excited about this opportunity. Um, and, and I will I, I will be honest, Ruth said we, we would need a moderator, whether you or one of the other rabbis. And I immediately said, no, no, pick me, pick me. Um, I wanted to be here because I also was so excited to um, to meet our author today, Janine Cummins. And um, after reading this book, um, really, really wanted to meet the, the woman behind it because uh, it was such a powerful read. And um, on so many levels, which I am sure we will we will talk about. So I, I want to introduce you not just by uh, by face, but also tell you a little bit about our author Janine Cummins. She's the author of the number one New York Times bestseller, American Dirt. Uh, which, this is the only drawback to the fact that we are on Zoom is that um, we can't all have Janine sign, but she, she, her family is in the Gaithersburg area. So hopefully in the future when, when she is able to be here and we're able to be in person, we could have that opportunity. Um, so American Dirt was both an Oprah book club and a Barnes and Noble book club selection. This novel has been translated into almost 40 languages. We saw uh, a, uh, another title, another language uh, on Janine's um, uh, background a little earlier, and it has sold over a million copies worldwide. It is currently a finalist for the Goodreads Choice Award for Best Novel of 2020, so please vote. Hopefully we can still vote on that, uh, and she'll, she'll let us know if we can. Uh, Cummins also wrote A Rip in Heaven, A Memoir of Murder and Its Aftermath, and the novels The Outside Boy and The Crooked Branch. She lives in New York with her husband, two children, and their rescue dog, Joan Jett. Uh, we saw the view from her, from her windows of the Tappan Zee Bridge or whatever it's called now. I'll always call it the Tappan Zee. Uh, and I know it's a beautiful day there as well. This is such a wonderful way for us to, uh, to come together at the end of the week and as we prepare to, to begin Shabbat and also to really grapple with uh, a topic that is so incredib incredibly relevant in um, today. And, um, and to have the opportunity to, to really reflect on this powerful story. And, uh, and I, um, I'm thrilled again to have Janine Cummins with us. Uh, she is going to, to speak and to share with us and then we'll have an opportunity for questions. So once more, I invite you to send questions to me in the chat uh, and we'll, we'll have a conversation 
after after she speaks. Janine, thank you so, so much for, for being with all of us. And clearly, as the numbers keep going up and the number of participants, uh, and I know you've been getting great acclaim, uh, we are, we're so thrilled to have you with us and we are so grateful to you for, for your writing and, and for this opportunity. So thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm really grateful for the invitation. I love these opportunities to, to talk with readers. It's been some crazy year, you know, for everyone. And um, I think I can say specifically for me, it's been pretty intense. And it has been a great balm to me to have these opportunities to sit down and really discuss the book with readers. Of course, my phone is ringing right now. As soon as I sit down to start talking, I thought I put it on mute. I apologize. Um, so I'm just going to begin by telling you all a little bit about how I came to write the book. I started writing the book in 2013. So I don't know about you guys, but I barely remember what Earth was like in 2013. So much has changed um, just in the last 12 months, 10 months alone never mind the last seven years. It was a very, very different cultural landscape at the time that I started writing this book. There was no such thing as a President Trump. There was no such thing as building a wall in the national zeitgeist. We weren't, we weren't there yet. Um, you know, I just had a sense that we weren't doing a very good job even then at conducting our national conversation when it came to this topic of compulsory migration in the Americas. And it baffled me because I saw that the, the citizens of this country tended to be very invested and very generous when it came to reaching out um, for refugees from other parts of the world. But they were really resistant to, to seeing the need at our own doorstep and to acknowledging that you know it really was a need. Um, and so I started digging into that and I wanted to understand a little bit more about, you know, what was causing that kind of resistance. And, and I hoped ultimately to write a novel that would, you know, invite readers to, to recognize the plight of people who have no choice really, um, but to flee from their home places. And so when I first started writing this book, you know, I began with doing a tremendous amount of research. I, I read everything I could find from novels to, um, you know, articles in the Mexican media to doctoral thesis papers online in both Spanish and English, you know, from various universities um, in both countries. Uh, people who are studying migration patterns and the push factors of compulsory migration in the Americas. And, and then when I felt like I had a decent foundation, I went to Mexico and I visited migrant shelters. I visited orphanages. I volunteered at a desayunador, which is a soup kitchen for migrants. Um, I, I talked to everyone who I could find who was willing to talk to me, um, who knew more about this subject than I did. So that was people everyone from you know scholars to humanitarian aid workers the people who were running the shelters the, the mostly nuns and priests who were running the shelters um people who were documenting human rights abuses along both sides of the border the lawyers who were doing the pro bono legal aid work of of uh, you know representing unaccompanied kids um just everyone i could find you know and i talked to a lot of migrants themselves and Throughout the process of doing that, I kept running into my own fear. You know, I really was, if I'm being honest, I was very nervous about writing this book. And so the first two drafts were ter frankly terrible. They were really bad. Um, and I threw the whole book out twice and started over. And I mean, I had like a full 80,000 word draft that I threw out. Um, two times. Because I think initially, you know, I was trying to write a story about compulsory migration without writing a book that was set in Mexico. I tried to write this book initially set in the borderlands. Um, 
and it just wasn't working. I was, it was an inappropriate lens. I was trying to force a round peg into a square hole. It wasn't, it wasn't working. And I, I was aware that it wasn't working, but I was so resistant to doing what I thought the book needed, which was to go back to Mexico, to go back to the origin stories, how these characters arrived at the border. Um, and then there was a moment in my life that changed everything. And that was three and a half years into the writing of the novel, um, the week before the 2016 presidential election, my mom and dad went out to dinner with some friends in Gaithersburg and my dad died at the dinner table in the restaurant. I keep waiting for this story to get easier to tell. I've told it so many times this year and I'm not there yet. Um, it was, a, my dad was 71 years old. He was in the prime of his life. He was a deacon at St. Martin's um, Catholic Church in Gaithersburg. He was a pillar of the community. He was beloved by so many people, including us. And we really thought we had like at least two more decades with him. So his passing was a tremendous shock and a trauma really. And it surprised me because I have had trauma before in my life. I've had really significant trauma. I've had tremendous grief. Um, and I thought I knew how to handle that. I thought I was strong. I thought I could handle anything. I, I knew how to grieve. I was an expert at grieving. Um, but when my dad died, all bets were off. I was really incapacitated by his sudden passing. And I was kind of angry at my book because I felt I was already frustrated with the book. And then I remember the feeling it was a Monday night. And I, I remember like slapping my laptop closed that evening and feeling so annoyed with this book, like it just wasn't working. And, and then it was about two hours later that my brother called with this news. And, and I thought, what a waste. All this time, all these months and years that I've poured into this book that is garbage that I could have spent with my dad, you know? And so I really put it away and I put I really put my whole life away for a number of months, but I'm a mom and I can't do that forever, you know? Um, but I was, I was in a bad way. And I think the fact that this happened also at the same moment um, as that 2016 presidential election was really, um, it compounded my grief because, I mean, politics aside, I had never seen in my life um, so much bitterness and so much hatred in this country that I love. I, I was shocked by the way we had resorted to talking to each other and my dad dying in the middle of that really ugly moment. It just felt like all the decency had gone out of the world at once. And I was very, I was bereft, you know? Um, and then a few months passed and when I began finally to emerge from the worst part of that despair, I think I realized that there was a way I might be able to kind of write my way out of it. You know, that I could, all these stories, the research that I had been steeping in for the last three and a half years, that maybe there was a way I could kind of stack them on top of each other and climb out of the pit I was in. And so I started to write and the first day that I attempted to return to the book, I dragged my laptop into bed with me, which I, I don't think I've ever done that before. I've never written in bed. I was like not even conducting personal hygiene at this moment in my life. So I just dragged this laptop into bed with me and I wrote the opening scene of American Dirt. And um, I didn't even realize at the time that I was writing the opening scene, that I was starting over, that I would never return to that previous draft I had been working on. But I think I knew as soon as it was written, as soon as I read back those seven pages, I knew that this was the book I had been resisting for three and a half years, that it was the book my dad would be proud of. 
um, I like knew what I had to do. So a few weeks later, I rented a casita in Arizona, deep in the borderlands, out in the desert, in the middle of nowhere. Um, and I went there alone for eight days and I wrote almost half the book in, eight, in those eight days. I wrote for like 16 hours a day. And I think, you know, it was backed up in me. This book had been, I think it was already there and I just, wasn't willing to write it. And then I had this moment in my life where, you know, grief can do this really liberating springboard thing for you sometimes where you kind of don't care anymore about anything else. Um, and I just, I had a really painful new perspective on what mattered to me and what didn't matter. And there was a time when I felt like I don't care what anyone has to say about this book. I just need to write it. And, and I did. Um, when I returned from Arizona with half a novel, I re-engaged in my life, started occasionally cooking for my children again. Um, and I finished the book in about eight or 10 months from that point. Um, this story is like, I said, it doesn't seem to get easier. One day it will um, to tell. But the thing is, it feels really important for me to share it with people um, when we're talking about this book because I want readers to understand that the book did not come from a place of entitlement in me. It came from grief and love. And um, it came from a deep, desire to shine a spotlight on an injustice that I felt people weren't paying close enough attention to. Um, <clears throat> so that is, I think I've decided for better and for worse, um, how I ended up here with you guys today um, with this completed novel and um, the opportunity, thank God for it to reach so many wonderful readers um, who have really, despite all the noise that surrounded the publication of this book, really embraced it and opened their hearts to it. And I am so grateful for that. So from there, I will um, turn it back to you, Rabbi Shankman, and let you sort of um, direct where, how, where we go next with the conversation. Um, well, first, on behalf of all of us, how, how grateful we are to you for, um, as I said already, certainly for your words, those on, on paper, but also, um, also for your time today and for sharing with us so, um, so personally and, and poignantly um, the origin story behind, um, behind this book and certainly those themes uh, of of grief and love that you were uh, you were grappling with and and embracing in your own life come through so powerfully and I think that is just one of the many aspects of of what makes uh, makes this such a powerful read and um, and certainly uh, we all wish that you had not had to go through the experiences that that brought the book out. Um, and also hope that that in in that process of, of writing that there was there were some aspects of healing. Uh, I I know that I, I was able to. I'm sure others have seen as well. I, I as I told you earth, earlier, I saw your um, your talk at Politics and Prose here in, in Washington, and um, and you spoke so beautifully there as well about your your dad as being your you know your biggest fan and cheerleader. And we all know that, uh, we hope that you feel his love uh, shining down on you and certainly that, that pride. And um, we have a saying in Judaism uh, about, about honoring a memory and a legacy. And you certainly have honored your father's life in, um, in your words and in, yeah. in being able to sit down and, and write this. So as we say, Zichrono Livracha, may his memory always be a blessing. And it certainly is through you. Thank you. You're welcome. One of the questions uh, foremost for, for actually a few people was the title. 
how how did you come up with the title uh, American Dirt? So it's funny, it's the only book I've written where the title came to me quite early in the process of writing the book. Um, it was with me through those two terrible drafts. Um, and typically I write the book first and then I spend some excruciating number of days filling a loose leaf binder with terrible options for a title before I land on one that I don't hate. Um, so I was really grateful to have a title early. Um, it felt like it gave me something to write toward. I like the fact that this title can mean so many different things, that it's ambiguous enough that the reader can sort of project their ideas onto it um, at the beginning of the book and then those ideas might shift as they read. I, you know, I wanted to, there was some pushback from the Canadians and from a couple of the Latin American accounts early before they read the book when they heard the title um, and they, so this question was asked of me by some of those retail accounts before the book even came out. Um, because as lots of people in this country are not really aware, um, there is some exasperation elsewhere in the Americas that United States citizens have maybe accidentally just sort of co-opted the term American. Um, <laughs> and that, in fact, there are two whole continents worth of people um, from many, many different cultures and countries who are part of the Americas and whose lands are American lands. So, you know, um, there was a little bit early in the, the publication process of the Canadians saying, explain yourself, please. And I was really happy to do that because you know, in my mind, the whole book takes place on American dirt. I, I was very careful not to use the word American um, anywhere in the book, except for that one place where, am I doing spoilers, by the way? Has everyone read the book? I don't want to give anything away. I, I, hopefully, hopefully people have read the book. I, I will tell you, even if, if there's a spoiler, um, please, please read it. It is, okay. it is so worthwhile, and um, and I think you'll just... I can, I can talk around the points that are, like, there's a character who arrives at the border at one stage, and she, she sort of spits through the bars to leave a piece of herself there on American dirt. And in that moment, um, it's the only moment where I use that word in the book, and it felt to me like a nod to all the ter territorial ways that we've come to use that word. Um, and, you know, I felt I wanted to evoke, I think, in the reader at that point, this sense of like how arbitrary that border really is, that the dirt on one side of that fence is no different from the dirt on the other side of the fence. It's all the same dirt. Um, so, you know, that was part of it. I don't know if you guys noticed if, you, if any of you read the hardcover rather than listening to it on Audible or, or reading it on a Kindle or something, but the end papers inside the hardcover are a map. And we had that map commissioned specifically because I wanted a borderless map to, sh to really illustrate the topography. It's so clear when you see it like that, that this is all one piece of land and um, that it's really tr tragic, but also, um, unnecessary that so many people should be in danger um, based on the lottery of what, which side of that fence they happen to be born on. Um, so I wanted the title to sort of evoke some of those ideas about the actual dirt of the land, the actual tierra, but also, um, you know, a nod to the sort of dirty little secret about how we treat immigrant migrants specifically in this country. Um, and, you know, I just, I felt like there were lots of different ways that the title could work. So I liked that. So, um, and, and you actually answered, a, a preemptively answered another question that was shared about 
all the noise um, about the book when it was published that you referred to. And some of it, I think you, you referred to in there and perhaps another piece of it might, uh, might also be embodied in uh, this next question, which uh, is why, um, why were people so upset that, that you wrote about the immigrant experience not being an immigrant? Why would that matter? And I know you, you talked about uh, at the beginning, you talked a little bit about wanting to make sure that, that people knew you weren't talking about this from a place of entitlement. Yeah. And that may also, you know, uh, that may also connect to that, that question. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the, the, pro the only problem with that question is that we could talk about nothing else for like the next three weeks and still only scratch the surface. It was such a complicated explosion of feeling that happened around this book, the publication. And I, I worked in publishing for 10 years. I have never seen anything like it. Um, I think part of it has to do with this sort of junction that we're experiencing right now in this country, where we are at as a country um, in so many different ways. There was like a confluence of um, circumstances among which were vitriol is like our new national pastime, you know? So this is the way we talk to each other now. Instead of when we disagree with someone, instead of saying, oh, that's interesting. I don't think I agree, but please help me understand your point of view. Instead, we say, you're a racist piece of garbage and you, sh you should die. Um, and <laughs> that's, kind of what happened. Um, so there's that. And then there's also this really frightening um, deterioration of truth. So there was a tremendous amount of, um, there was a tremendous amount of sort of distortion and fabrication of ideas about who I am, um, which really haven't, had nothing to do with the book. Um, but had to do with my ethnicity and my race. And some of those assertions were made in really bad faith by people who know nothing about me. Um, and the upshot, you know, was that, and we are also, I have to say, and this is the most important thing, we are living at a time specifically in our culture where we are finally beginning to reckon with the fact that voices of color have been underrepresented, undervalued, underpaid forever in the publishing world. And that's just a fact. I mean, it is, it, it, it's true. And it's specifically true of Mexican um, writers. So where we do have um, some representation of Latino people in publishing, a, a, probably a, a very, um, disproportionate number of those writers are Caribbean Latinos. So they are Puerto Rican people like me, um, or they may be Cuban or Dominican. Um, there are not a lot of Mexican writers well represented on the bookshelves. So when you combined that fact that we are trying to reckon with that, we weren't doing it in a way that was meaningful enough before American Dirt. Um, and then there were these sort of distorted assertions about who I am um, and this sense that I was a very privileged white lady um, who swooped in and, and stole a story from Mexican people and, and then got, you know, stole all the, the praise and the accolades um, and the recognition for a story that was not mine to tell. Um, I can understand in some ways some of the outrage that surrounded the publication. Um, but I also have to say, you know, so some of it I think is on the publishing industry. They have to do a better job of creating space for those writers and of elevating those voices that have been ignored for too long. Um, but but I should say, I will go to the mat um, for the absolute freedom and liberty of any fiction writer to write any story that moves in her heart. Um, 
And I don't believe it should be the job of Twitter to decide whether or not a writer is Latino enough to tell a, an, to write a novel. You know, if you do the work and you put the time in and you want to write the story that moves in your heart, it should be for the reader to decide whether or not you succeeded in that endeavor. Um, and my ethnicity is not up for debate. It's no one else's, it's no one's business. I happen to be Irish and Puerto Rican. Um, I'm very proud of my heritage and it has nothing to do with the novel that I wrote. So it was really painful to see my ethnicity adjudicated on Twitter. You know, people determining for me that because I acknowledged my whiteness in an essay I wrote five years ago, suddenly that means I'm not, some, somehow that means I'm not Latino as, you know, as if like, I really didn't understand, I guess, that in 2020, I would have to explain to people Puerto Ricans come in different colors. <laughs> you know, it's possible to be both. I am white. Yes, I am also Latina. And I always have been. And, and even if I wasn't, I had every right to write this novel. Um, so, yeah, I mean, even that very convoluted, long-winded answer really doesn't but scratch the surface of what was going on because there were so many different layers to it. Um, I really could go on for hours and I will try to refer. You know, it's um, what's, what's interesting um, and, and I don't wanna go down this path because this could act, as you already said, we could spend three weeks talking about, you know, well, many aspects, but, um, but it's, it's interesting as well in, in, in that piece of, of your experience when we all know, uh, we, we still have a, we have a long way to go uh, right in, yeah. in our society, in our culture, and um, and people, whether we call them armchair, whatever we want to say, um, those who judge others, uh, I personally believe there's one true judge, and it's for the rest of us to um, not judge, but but try to understand and stand in someone else's shoes. There are many, many books out there that are written by men and written in a, a woman's voice or tell, or, or tell a, a woman's story. And I've never heard anyone say, well, how can you, as a man, uh, I haven't heard that kind of criticism. So I, you know, I think that also speaks to sort of the, the cultural aspects of, um, you know, also in the question of who owns a story and, and how do we get involved and engaged in a conversation about something that's important. Um, and, um, and, I, and doing that in a way that's respectful and yet also opens that door. Yes, and it's something that I was really engaged with thinking about the whole time I was writing this book, you know? I took tremendous care, um, maybe partially because I am Latina and I, I wanted to make sure that I wasn't writing into stereotypes. You know, it was very important to me to make sure that I was taking great care with those things. And if people, if there are readers out there who think I failed in that endeavor, fair enough, you know? <laughs> but um, I, I think there, I think the way that it exploded was less about the quality of the book or lack thereof, and more about the perceptions of me as a person, which felt really new and alarming as a writer. You know, I haven't seen that kind of, I mean, the hate was so intense that my publisher had to cancel my tour. There were actual threats of violence against me. It was insane. Um, and I've, I've, never, I've never seen anything like that. It was very unfortunate. Um, but I also think, you know, the upshot is that publishers have taken notice and they have really made they've probably made 10 years worth of progress on this front in the last 10 months because of American Dirt, because of the uproar. Um, every major house has hired a, a chief officer of diversity and inclusion. They are all developing plans on how to do better at representing underrepresented communities. Um, they are really making not just sort of smoke and mirrors kind of efforts, but like real world logistical efforts to 
right the wrongs of the past. Um, That's great to hear. I I am glad in some ways, I wish I hadn't been the catalyst for that. Um, You know, it it will always remain confusing to me how a part Latina person um, became the sort of poster child for white supremacy in (laughs) the publishing world. Um, But there you have it. It's, it, it, it's, it was crazy. Well, I'm sure. Um, by the way, as an aside, one of our readers shared that you're in good company with Governor Bill Richardson and Soledad O'Brien, among others who are uh, Latina, Irish. Uh, so we have a number of questions, um, including uh, one uh, asking, and this gets, gets into the book, uh, and then there's some other, there are a number of others. Um, why did Lydia select uh, Love in the Time of Cholera? In, in all fairness and, and transparency, Elaine Bartner actually put it in Spanish. My Spanish is awful. I could try to, to read it, but um, I don't want to embarrass myself. Uh, mm-hmm. But I know that that's what it means because I can, I can translate it. I just can't speak it as well. Um, and you end the book by, by saying, no one can take this from her. This book is hers alone. So why did she select that to read? The book, um, so, I mean, I just, I happen to love that book. And I do believe that, you know, Marquez, most people will say that 100 Years of Solitude is his masterpiece. Those people are wrong, frankly, no. <laughs> um, I, I love Love in the Time of Cholera. I think that is his greatest book. Um, it's one of my favorites. And I just felt like there were certain parallels between the two main characters in that book and the experiences of Lydia's life. Um, And so it made sense for her to be sort of drawn to that novel. And then, you know, the fact that she ends by reading it and and staking ownership over that novel. you know, there's a line from my memoir and the, the after afterward of my memoir, I wrote about, you know, the effect that crime and violence can sometimes have on victims. And I talked about, you know, to me, the most terrifying thing about being the victim of, of violence is that sometimes that experience can inspire such hatred within the victim that she becomes capable of those same kind of monstrosities that she's been a victim of. And that to me is far more frightening than, you know, any threat of physical brutality is the threat of an alteration to her soul, you know, of damage to her soul, of making her capable of that kind of hatred. And and it was always important to me as, a survivor of trauma um, to protect that most, I think most important element of who I am and to not let hatred win, to not allow, um, you know, myself to be infected with the bloodlust of the people who committed the violence against my family. And I think it was really important for me in the end that all four of these protagonists would win that battle in their soul, that they would hold on to who they were despite all the trauma that they experience, that they wouldn't only survive in body, but that they would also survive um, spiritually. Really beautiful. Uh... I actually want to follow up on that aspect of our, our at least our main uh, protagonists. Uh, there are a number of questions that um, connect to immigration, which I'll, I'll come back to, but um, but just seems to go to this right now. Uh, Lydia and Luca expressed their grief differently, not just the adult child version, but very layered. Um, does that reflect, and I guess, how does that reflect your own experience with grief? This book, you know, as I was writing it, I was living my grief in real time. And I also did have the experience of, you know, that I've alluded to several times when I was a teenager, we had a 
horrific trauma, a horrific family tragedy that I wrote about in my memoir, Rip in Heaven. Um, two of my family members were murdered by strangers. And I, so I, I do think I had, I think that experience absolutely informed my capacity to write about trauma and what it is to be a person who is trying to grieve in the midst of a really intense trauma because very often what happens is that the grief is really subverted by the work of survival of just like getting through the next hour and the next day it becomes more immediate than um, the long-term work of healing from the loss that you have experienced. I brought all that to bear, to be sure, on these characters. Um, but also, I mean, quite simply, whenever I had a bad day, which was like, to be frank, every day for like two years, um, I would write it into one of my characters. So when I had the bad, um, grief moment, I would give it to Soledad or Luca um, or, you know, whichever character, you know, felt to me at that point able to handle it. Um, and I just, I do think that so much of what this book is about is that the bonds of parental love, what we will do to save each other, you know, the relationships between parents and, and children and grieving the loss of that bond in my life while I was writing these characters um, absolutely, I think, informed the way that they evolved on the page. Um, you know, one thing that I love to think about is how, you know, everyone recognizes that Lydia saved Luca over and over and over again. Um, but I'd like to remember also that he saved her just as often, um, just by the very fact of his existence, you know, that he, he saved her. And I think that speaks to um, the intensity of the, the love that exists between parents and children. And I would argue as well that that is a bond that crosses every cultural and geographical boundary there is. One of the ways that, that you bring that out so powerfully, at least to me, because um, I was imagining what what would I do? How would I, uh, and, and this connects to a question that someone had in talking about the, the scenes of jumping on and off the, the trains, which so vivid. And to me, as a parent, you know, and also thinking about I, in the ages of the people who are doing this and thinking about Luca and, and other children, that was terrifying. And uh, when you talk about that survivalist instinct and that that parental love, um, it was it was something that Lydia certainly uh, could not imagine doing and, and watching it, you know, witnessing it was was horrified. Um, so the, the question that came from one of our readers is, how did you find out about these experiences? And I would add to that, did you did you actually, were you able to witness this? Did you experience it? Uh, but it really is so, um, so vivid and terrifying. And, you know, just the, in thinking about um, the, the journey that they're on, on and all of those layers and levels of that, but that, that primal aspect of, um, of when you talk about saving, uh, at times, literally, uh, and, and Lydia knew that, that Luca's life was in her hands. Yeah. Um, I did not ride La Bestia. It was never even in the cards for me. My husband was really, you know, we have two kids. And when I went to Mexico the first time, he was like a little mad at me because, <laughs> you know, um, kidnapping is endemic in Mexico right now. Um, there are just a tremendous number of journalists being murdered in Mexico. Anyone who's writing about the cartels, um, it's not the safest place to be poking around saying like, I'm interested in learning about 
um, narcotraficantes. You know, it's not a good idea. So we had long conversations about, you know, what was reasonable and unreasonable for me to undertake while I was, you know, doing the research in Mexico. And I will say that um, there were certain elements of those conversations where I pushed back, but there, writing La Bestia was never even in the universe of possibility. I want to live. Um, it is tremendously, tremendously dangerous. So I met lots of people who wrote La Bestia. I read an incredible book by Oscar Martinez or Oscar Torres. Um, I should look up his name. He wrote The Beast. He's a Central American writer. Um, and he did ride the train all the way from Chiapas to the, the border of the United States. And he interviewed all the people that he was riding the train with. And it is tremendously harrowing and insightful. Um, I highly recommend it if you wanna learn more about this. It's a great book. Um, so that gave me a good foundation. And then, you know, I, I watched a lot of YouTube videos, also harrowing. And, and then I met so many people who had made this, this journey. Um, there, was, there was one young man I met at a shelter in Tecate, Mexico. Um, who lost his leg three days before he came to that shelter while I was there. And, you know, I knew because of the research I had done before meeting him that this happens every single day, that people are falling off that train and being maimed and killed every day. Um, so in that way, I was prepared for it. Um, but it's a very different thing when you ha you see a young man who is in 22 years old from Honduras um, in the throes of trying to come to terms with what has just happened to him. Um, and I will say that, you know, there is a tremendous amount of solidarity among the migrants on the migrant trail. There is a tremendous amount of kinship. They tend to be, um, very kind to one another. When this young man showed up at the shelter, it was like dripping a bead of dishwashing liquid into a greasy pan. Like everyone just backed away from him um, out of respect, I think, and also out of fear, um, out of a, an acknowledgement that any one of them could have been in his position. Um, you know, this is why I think I had to write the book three times because every time I learned something new, every time I witnessed something with my own eyes that I had only read about before, it shifted my perspective so dramatically that nothing was the same after, you know? And so I'm really grateful for all the experiences like that, that I, that I had, that I was able to translate into the pages of the book. Thank you. So I'm going to get into, I'm going to actually try to, to put them together, but the, the immigration or related questions. And then I do want to save time for, there's a, there are a couple short, um, but, but final questions. Um, so, and this, by the way, this, this first part, a uh, number of people shared this when they asked her a question. I love the book and learned a lot uh, that, that's been repeated over and over. Uh, but this, this question is, are you communicating with Jacob Sabara from MSNBC who wrote his own book about children separated from their parents at the border? Um, so, so that specific question, very specific, uh, someone else expressed that you must feel like you're in a horror film with the way this administration has approached immigration. And um, we also have, so we have the Jacob Sabaroff question. Uh, you can Should express or not express your other feelings, but, uh, but the, there's, there's another one that we have from, from someone who actually has a lot of experience in this area as a, okay. as a judge. Um, if you could change US law, what change would you make so people forced to flee their country because of danger would have a legal way to migrate here without resorting to a dangerous journey, without involving smugglers. Mm. Our refugee and asylum law uses the definition in the UN Convention on Refugees. 
how would you broaden the definition of refugee to create a category for legal immigration of people forced to migrate as you term them? And oh by the way, if you wanna connect with that person because she does an incredible, yeah. um, has a lot of background and and, uh, and experience. Uh, but yeah. so that's sort of, those are the, the, the questions and comments on- So I'll try to take them one at a time. I haven't read um, that book yet. Um, I, and no, I'm not in contact with that journalist. I do, it's on my radar and it's something that I intend to, to dig into at some stage. I did recently just read a book, um, which is relatively new. It came out this summer called The Book of Rosie, which is the first book, I believe, written by a woman who was separated from her children in ICE custody. Um, and I expected it to be super depressing. And in fact, it's a beautiful, beautiful memoir, full of hope. Um, Rosaira Pablo Cruz is the author and the book is called The Book of Rosie. Um, really lovely story. Uh, the second part was, I'm sorry, I should have stopped you because yeah, I'm- That's okay. The, the second one was really just, uh, you must feel like you're in a horror uh, film. Horror. Look, I mean, I will say I do want to address that because I try not to get too political um, because it's really not about politics. After talking to like two to 300 book clubs over the last 10 months, I can tell you this is not a red or blue issue. You watch the news and they would have you believe that it is. But there is a whole lot of purple out there when it comes to this. Nobody in this country on either end of the political spectrum wants us to be taking children out of the arms of their parents at the border. Nobody. And the fact is there's a whole lot of political posturing going on and there's no political will to fix the problems of immigration. And if we were to have comprehensive immigration reform, I think there are some really simple things we could do almost immediately to make things better. Um, but in particular, I will say that the current administration's remain in Mexico policy is the stuff of nightmares. Um, and so basically what that policy says is that if you are a person who's doing it the right way and you come here, you make that journey and you turn yourself in at the border and you say, my life is in danger. I need asylum. I'm, I'm applying for asylum. Our government's response to that plea now is okay, just wait there in Mexico for up to 16 months while we you wait your turn in line. We have a 16 month backlog in our immigration courts. Um, we are asking these incredibly vulnerable women and children, girls like Soledad and Rebecca to wait on the streets in places like Ciudad Juarez and Tijuana where women and children are being, a woman is being murdered every two and a half hours. Two and a half hours, you know, often without any support, often without money, often without shelter. Um, we are saying to them, just wait 16 months, you'll get your turn. So because of that policy, people are venturing into the desert instead in greater and greater numbers and those people are dying. Um, we have always had a broken immigration policy. We have never been quite so gleefully cruel about it before. And it's alarming. This is not what America purports to be. And I don't think anybody wants this. You know, I just, I feel like there are, if, you know, it's on us to pressure our legislators, whatever our politics are, to say, this is not who we are. We have to do better. And this does bleed into the next, um, the, the next conversation about how I would change immigration law. I mean, I wish I had all the answers, but I do think there are some really specific things we could do immediately. I think that the asylum law is completely outdated. Um, it doesn't make sense anymore. And it doesn't actually provide relief to the people who most desperately need it. So we need to reassess what is our definition of a refugee? Who qualifies for asylum? Um, we desperately need an updated definition of who qualifies for asylum because 
the current asylum law is such that we can know almost without it beyond the shadow of a doubt that we are sending someone back to their death, that they are likely to be murdered if we return them to El Salvador or Guatemala. And we are doing that anyway because they don't meet the legal definition of a refugee who um, should be entitled to asylum. That isn't right. Like surely we can do better. Um, and, and then I think some of the ways in which we might be able to help with that, why don't we set up remote offices in some of the places where um, people are experiencing the most intense push factors, where people are running for their lives, where people have to leave these countries and sometimes walk 2000 miles to get to the border um, only to be turned back and then returned to whatever danger they were running from. Um, why don't we go to those countries and allow people the opportunity to apply for asylum before they leave? Um, why are we making them walk 2000 miles and then wait you know, 16 months in the immigration court backlog? Why don't we spend some of the budget that we have forked over in greater and greater numbers every year to the United States Border Patrol who have been largely ineffective at creating a real barrier um, and give that to hiring more immigration judges, shortening that backlog and allowing for a, a, a more meaningful reckoning with who deserves to be in this country, um, who deserves security um, in the United States. I just, I feel like those are really simple things that are not political. You know, we could do those right away. And I feel like, like 85% of the country would be on board. <laughs> maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm like being a Pollyanna, but that's what I think. I'm also, while we're on this subject, I'm putting in the chat box right now. I know some of you have already donated. Um, I just put a link to this fundraiser that I've been running with the International Rescue Committee. Um, I am matching all donations up to $100,000 through this, through this link. If you are able to donate, the, the IRC has tremendous outreach and expertise in the borderlands. They are underfunded, their programs in the borderlands. I don't understand why, but they tell me that in other places around the world where they have programs that serve refugees, People have been very generous, but when it comes to the United States-Mexico border, where a migrant is dying every 16 hours in the desert, um, they are desperate for funds. So here is a real world thing you can do to immediately make an impact and save lives. Thank you, because that was certainly gonna be one of the questions is what can we do? Um, and really appreciate uh, everything that you just shared. And uh, I know there's much more to be said on this topic. Um, and in, in Judaism, we have this uh, teaching that basically expresses the idea that um, that when there are those those problems, that, that what we really need to do is go, and in the story, uh, it's going upstream to figure out what what the origin is, what the what the issue is. And that's where we need to start to repair rather than what we're seeing, which is this build up and build up in a place where it's where we're um, we're reacting, but we're not solving the right. problem where it actually is and where it originates. Um, yeah, and it originates. You know, this is another this is another thing that I think is so important to to zoom out and exactly what you're saying is that you know it doesn't even originate in those faraway countries that are sending huge numbers of refugees or migrants here. It also originates with us. It originates with the symbiotic relationship that exists between the United States and these other countries in the Americas, you know, because it is, I mean, our, as, a, as the global superpower that we are, um, our immigration policy, our foreign policy, our drug policy, all have ripple effects that echo across the Americas. And not to say we deserve 100% of the blame for why we have a couple of potentially failed states in Central America whose inhabitants are fleeing for our border every day. 
Um, but we deserve some of the responsibility for why things are so unstable in those places. And we have to be part of the solutions. That's true. Um, so I want to I want to get to our, our final questions. Also, I want to um, respect for your time and those who are, are with us. One, one of the questions uh, is about the cover of the book itself. Yeah. Um, what do, if anything, what do the birds on the cover signify? So it's, people ask that almost every time I talk to a book club. And I don't know if you guys realize, but like the author has nothing to do with the cover. Um, I like this cover a lot, actually, but I didn't like it initially because there was a, there was a different cover first, and I fell in love with that cover. And then they took that cover to like Target and Barnes and Noble, and and all the retailers were like, "Nope, it's too quiet, it's too dark," and I was like, "No, I love that cover." So it took me a long time to warm up to this one, um, and. But now that it's out in the world, I have to say, I do think it's the right cover for the book. I think it's memorable and fresh and pretty. The birds, I don't know what the designer was thinking initially, but I will tell you what um, I project onto them. When I, when I look at the cover now, I feel like if you've ever been to the borderlands, one of the most sort of fascinating things about standing at the border is seeing how nature makes a mockery of this weird, um, very imposing structure. And every time you're there, invariably there are birds perched on top of this wall, just kind of mocking the border patrol, like which way will I fly today, you know? Um, and just being the evidence that, um, this man-made effort to separate a landmass, which is naturally not separate, um, is, it's a bizarre, it's a bizarre thing. Like, especially if you go to Parque de la Amistad in Tijuana and you see the, the fence tapers all the way into the ocean and the water just like mixes back and forth through the fence and the dust blows back and forth across and the birds fly back and forth and the lizards and all the, you know, all the wildlife. And it's just a very strange experience of, of being there and, and, and seeing the, the stark um, difference between what's natural and what's man-made. And I feel like the birds evoke that kind the kind of freedom that you you hope for when you stand at the border and you tip your head back and you look at the sky and you see the birds there's something really powerful about that so for me it, it evoked that kind of feeling thank you so uh our final sort of group of questions and i'll say it, it won't they're not long but um when is the movie coming out uh, could you share a little bit about um, your agent, how the book was promoted and the wonderful response um, that you received and also what's next? And we will hope when your next book comes out that we'll be able to have you in person. Yes. I hope so. um, the movie is like a whole other beast. So I've tried to kind of not worry too much about it because Hollywood is such a different animal and I really will have no very little input into how that develops. Um, but they are working on a script and I'm hopeful that there will be a movie someday. I mean, they did re-option uh, the rights very recently. So they are still intending to make the movie, but everything's on hold right now with you know the pandemic. So there's not really any news on that front. Um, my agent is, amazing. His name is Doug Stewart. He works for an agency called Sterling Lord Literistic. Um, he's been with me since my first novel. And I will say that when I turned this book in after five years of writing, he wrote back to me and in the subject header of his email, he said, wow, 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 which he has never done before. Um, and I think he knew right away that this book was different, that it was going to be different. And I didn't have that sense when I was writing it. I, I felt like I was just doing the same work I'd always done. Like I was writing the story that I cared deeply about. Um, 
when I started writing it, it was not timely. It was on no one's radar. And in fact, that was part of the reason I wrote it because I felt like people weren't paying attention to this thing that I wanted people to pay attention to. And then it just so happened that it took me so long to write the book that by the time I turned it in, it was super timely. It was um, the same weekend that, that we submitted the book to 26 different editors in the publishing industry. Um, the first migrant caravan arrived at the border so it was on the front page of the New York Times that same weekend. It was serendipity. Um, and then, you know, the response was crazy. We had our first yes less than 24 hours after submitting the book. And then we had 22 yeses by that Tuesday. Um, so the book ended up going to auction. There were, I think, by the time the auction began, 14 editors at nine different houses bidding for the right to publish this book, which blew my mind in every way. Um, you know, previous to this, I had been a very firmly lower mid-list author and was very happy to be there. Um, never dreamed that I would have this kind of reception for any book in my career. And then after Amy Einhorn at Flatiron Books won the auction, um, we went to work editing the book. She was amazing, tremendous editor. She made the book so much better than it was when it when she bought it. And, and then when it was finally ready, we started sending it out. And it was so, I mean, it was a dream come true, the way that people responded to this book initially, you know, getting my very first quote was from none other than Stephen King. And then, you know, the praise just kept coming. It came from a very diverse landscape of readership from some of my personal heroes, people like Sandra Cisneros and John Grisham and Julia Alvarez and um, just Ann Patchett, you know, Don Winslow, all of these people who were larger than life to me. And then Miss Oprah Winfrey herself, you know, <laughs> it was just mind blowing. And the the phone call from Oprah, I am going to be dining out on that one for the rest of my life. Like it really was a highlight of my life and I will never forget it. Even, you know, with everything that happened um, with all the backlash that eventually um, surrounded the book. I think one of the greatest gifts that I had from this publication was that almost because of that, the intensity of the hatred when it eventually happened. I was surrounded by this tribe of incredible women. Um, at the forefront of that tribe was Oprah. And they were all women who had been through hatred, who know of hatred, who understand how to navigate that, um, and how to have the courage of your convictions, even when people are being really vicious and to stick to your intention and know who you are. Um, and, you know, that was one thing that Oprah said to me over and over again, just always return to your intention. It's very clear to anyone who reads this book with an open heart, it's very clear what your intention was. Um, and it's clear that you succeeded in that endeavor. And she said, how dare anyone tell me that I was not supposed to feel the things that I felt when I read your book and you know, that kind of thing makes it almost worth it um, to have had to endure the intensity of the hatred um, that rained down upon me months later. Um, but, you know, I can zoom out now 10 months after the publication and I can see that, you know, I have, like I mentioned, I've talked to a couple hundred book clubs at this point, so many people of color so many Latino people, Mexican people who have reached out to me or who have been parts of these book clubs to, to tell me how much they love and support the book, to remind me that pe you know, Latino people are not a monolith, that no 30 or 50 really loud, angry people on Twitter um, can speak for Latino response to this book. Um, I know now, I know deeply in my heart that, um, there was a very loud, very angry, very small number of people who sort of hijacked the narrative about what the public response to this book was. Um, but as you mentioned at the beginning, 
it has been voted into the final round of the, the Goodreads Choice Awards, which is the most gratifying thing to me because those are actual readers, you know, um, speaking to how they felt about this book. And I, I could not be more gratified or validated or happy. Um, you, you now have a, a whole uh, group of people here as well who are huge fans and um, and we are so, so grateful for this time with you. We just wanna know what you're working on next. <laughs> and, um, and and also, I know that some are wondering, I know you said you, you'll go to book clubs. I think there are probably a few people here who would, and myself included, um, who would love to invite you to, uh, to some smaller book clubs as well. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm not working on anything, if I'm being honest. I'm working on my tan, which is difficult because it's November now. Um, it's been a hard year. And, you know, I've got my kids at home, remote learning. Um, and really, even if that wasn't the case, the intensity of what happened to me, the public flogging that I just took for writing this novel um, meant that I really needed a minute to get my head back on straight to ensure that when I do begin the next novel, I'm not writing into my fear. I don't want to self-censor. I don't wanna be scared away from writing a story that I care about because I'm not the right person based on someone else's determination of who is the right person to write that story. You know, the stories that I care about most deeply are, tend to be social justice stories. And I don't believe that the onus should be only on people of color to write about injustice and inequality in this country. I feel like we all have a responsibility to be participating in those conversations, to be grappling with those difficult and fascinating issues of inequality of all different kinds in our, in our culture and, and racial dynamics and ethnicity and all of those interesting things um, that absolutely have a bearing on my life. And, and so I want to make sure that I can freely and openly explore those topics um, in whatever novel I determine to write next without being cowed by my fear. Um, and that I feel like I'm getting there and I'm almost ready to begin, which will make my editor quite happy because we have a contract for the next book. So um, I don't know what it will be yet, but it will be happening soon. Well, we will, um, we will certainly look forward to that. Um, yeah. And and we, I mean, we, as you said earlier, in terms of the, of the topic, we could go for weeks. We also could uh, could continue on and on with you. You are so delightful. Um, people have been writing in just how um, how wonderful you are, how open, how refreshing, and just a beautiful human being. Uh, and um, thank you, really, thank you so much for for sharing so much of yourself in the, on the pages of, of this compelling and moving story. And, um, and also for the opportunity to talk about this with you. It's, it's a, certainly a must read clearly from our, our RSVPs, our registration, also those who are here. Uh, and I, I know you're, you're hearing that, but again, uh, just a huge thank you. And especially at this time when we know we're gonna gather around tables that are a little bit smaller than um, we might want them to be this year, but that gratitude for, uh, you know, for for being able to to have this opportunity for us to all come together. And I would be remiss if I didn't say um, I ask you to please post where we can vote for this book as best of 2020. So if you, okay. I don't know if you're if you could put that in the chat. Um, I, I should just say you have to be a member of Goodreads. So if you're on Goodreads, just go to Goodreads and. Um, it should be on the front page. I'll look for it right now, but it's, it's the Goodreads Choice Awards and this book is nominated in the fiction category. So it's the very first category that comes up. I'm, I'm looking for it right now. I will send the link, but you won't be able to vote unless you have a Goodreads account. You have to be a member. Which is definitely worth it. I can, I can share that if you're not already a member. And it doesn't cost anything. You just type, you know, you make an account and then you can keep track of the books you're reading. So I just put the link there in the chat box, but you can go also, if you're on Goodreads, just go to Goodreads and it should pop right up. So Great. thank, thank you. you. 
for that. Um, also, I just want to mention that um, I, because uh, a couple of people have asked about the recording of this session, uh, Beth Donaldson, I believe is still on, um, may be able to either tell you or will be able to follow, follow up. I know there will be a recording available shortly after, I, well, I, it may be in a day or so. And, um, and in addition, I know that we are in the process of thinking about our future opportunities and uh, so glad that, that, um, that everyone was so interested in, in, having this, uh, in having this opportunity and we want to continue uh, talking about uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful writing and, and books and stories that are out there, but also getting into some of these compelling issues. Uh, so many people are getting a lot of things in the chat just saying um, that the book was amazing and Janine that you've enhanced, uh, this is from Ellen Winston, you've enhanced her feelings. Certainly, mm -hmm. I think for all of us after reading the book and now having, having this time with you, it certainly has enhanced the book. And I'm going to have to go back and read it again, which will be well worth it. And mm -hmm. also a huge thank you to the Empty Nesters, to Jeff Bergman and um, Ruth Seif. Um, and I uh, loved having everybody here and, and being able to participate and see each other. Uh, and I, I think, you know, as we go into not just Thanksgiving, but the end of this year and, and God willing, a better 2021 than 2020 was, uh, <sighs> this is, this is inspiring and, um, and, and thank you for inspiring us in such a beautiful and personal and open way. Thank you. I really, I really enjoyed talking with you and I love seeing everybody's smiling faces on the screen. So thank you for having me.